Thanks very much, Rob. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I haven't got an offsider with me to uh, keep an eye on who's falling asleep, so I'll have to keep this reasonably snappy. Um, my job today is to provide a quick update on what's happening north of the border up in Queensland. A particular welcome to all the Queenslanders in the audience, um, specifically focusing on Brisbane, so looking at some, some of the major infrastructure projects underway and how they're being pulled together as part of an integrated framework under Connecting Brisbane. Um, just one slight disclaimer. Uh, we are um, in election mode. There's an election in less than two weeks in Queensland. And uh, please don't ask me who I think will win the election or who's got the better transport policies. I'm happy to share my views this evening over a um, German beer, but not this afternoon. So um, I'll stick to uh, what, where we're headed. And certainly transport is on the agenda, and that's a positive thing. Um, I'll just uh, snap through. I better turn that back on. There we go. Just a couple of introductory slides. We're part of a, quite a large department that looks after all transport in, in Queensland. My job is to look after TransLink, so I'm the head of the public transport part of the department. The vision we've got across the whole department is a single integrated network that's accessible to everyone. So that's really where we're at. That's a bit about what we do. Um, I'll start by looking at, um, at the current state of public transport in Brisbane, and this hopefully won't be too um, unfamiliar to many of you in the audience. Uh, you can see there on the right hand is our uh, current sort of network map in, uh, in Brisbane. Uh, we have an integrated public transport network. So TransLink look after four modes across South East Queensland, four mass transit modes. So uh, bus, rail, light rail and ferry. Uh, three of those modes are operating in Brisbane. So the focus for this afternoon's presentation is around Greater Brisbane. Uh, you can see there in the, uh, the green the network that you can see of our high frequency services. So they are services that operate at 15 minutes or better in terms of what we call uh, sort of turn up and go type frequency. Um, and you can see that they're spread. They're spread between the rail network and also the network on the busway, which uh, particularly the southeast busway, the eastern busway and feeding up to the north. Um, we have an interesting scenario in, um, in South East Queensland. About two thirds of our patronage on public transport is actually carried on bus. So bus is really the workhorse of the network. Uh, rail carries about one third of patronage, although it carries more passenger kilometres. So rail carries longer trips, largely from Golden Sunshine Coast and Ipswich into Brisbane. But bus is, um, particularly in the Brisbane context, carries um, significant numbers of, of customers around every day. Uh, that's off the back of um, a lot of investment in the busway network, particularly. Uh, our first piece of busway is now approaching 20 years old. So um, we're now in a stage where we're looking at how we can take the next step uh, with our busway network. Um, so in terms of um, some of the, uh, the challenges we've got, you can see there the broad numbers in terms of what we're up to. Um, the, the challenge for us, particularly in the inner part of Brisbane, is really around capacity of the network. Um, on the bus network, um, you know, the Brisbane uh, Transport for Brisbane network, so our largest um, bus operator in Brisbane is the Brisbane City Council business unit, Transport for Brisbane, they've got about 220 bus routes. 10% um, uh, of those routes carry about half the patronage. So our high frequency network, there's 20 bus routes that carry the lion's share of, of patronage across, uh, across Brisbane. Uh, they all, um, along with other, a lot of other services, congregate on the busway network in the peak period. And we've got some significant challenges around capacity, particularly on the Victoria Bridge, uh, cultural centre North Quay, and the uh, final sort of approach into Brisbane. Uh, we're currently um, in the peak of the peak, so that in the one hour in the PM peak, about 220 services in an hour. So that's, um, you can do the maths there, it's a bus every sort of 15 seconds or thereabouts um, servicing the cultural centre station. So um, some really significant um, capacity constraints starting to emerge in that inner part of the busway network. Uh, we've also got some challenges on the rail network. Uh, we've got, so in the last five years, we've made a number of investments in new rail corridors. Moreton Bay Rail uh, was opened last year, uh, Springfield Rail a few years before that, so servicing some of the rapidly growing parts of the network. Um, we're now at the stage where we've got a limited number of train paths to come into the CBD. Uh, we've got 24 train paths across the Brisbane River. We're currently using 22 of those. So we are approaching in that sort of peak one hour period, um, starting to approach um, the capacity constraints on the rail network as well. So clearly, um, investment is needed in the network in terms of growth. Um, looking at, and I know the focus of, um, of this conference is around mobility as a service, 
Um, my view on mobility as a service is not unlike, I think, Graham Curry's in terms of, I, don't, I think the invented word might have been something around fusion, that it's really about blending lots of um, new forms of mobility with traditional forms of mobility and providing more choice for customers. And I see um, my background is in urban planning, so my interest in transport is in cities. Um, and you know, mass transit particularly has a really important role to play and a continuing important role to play in moving large numbers of people very efficiently, creating productivity and livability in cities. Um, you, know, you can look at some of the pictures we saw earlier around what might happen to motorways full of autonomous vehicles, whether they're carrying people or not. Um, the modelling that we've done in the department is that um, the move to autonomous vehicles purely just based on the number of vehicles could really choke the city. So we need to look at continuing to promote more efficient, more effective ways of getting people into mass transit, and that's through the investment in the network. You can see there some of the things we're doing in terms of complementary solutions. Uh, we launched our first demand responsive transport pilot um, on the last day of September, so a couple of months ago in Logan. Uh, now that is a model of scaling up a taxi into a DRT type service where we can aggregate uh, passenger demand in some sort of uh, semi rural parts of uh, sort of northern Bow Desert, southern Logan area in, uh, in Brisbane, uh, areas that are traditionally quite difficult to service with buses. So early days on that pilot. I know um, John's going to talk to us about uh, what's happening in Sydney around DRT after I'm finished here today. So there's a lot happening around DRT. We see that that is an important part of the mix. We're keen to look at continuing to test different models around DRT. We've also got um, the first pilot of a small bus solution. So um, Clarks, uh, Graham and Yvonne and Reg and the team are running a, I think it's a 17 or 18 seat um, wheelchair accessible bus on a new um, bus route in Bean Lee, servicing the train station, a local shopping centre and providing some of that community access. So we're really looking at you know, mass transit at one end in terms of growing the capacity and the carrying capacity of the network and looking at some of those tailored um, sort of community based sort of lower, uh, lower density type solutions at the other end and then packaging up how they come together as part of an integrated model across transport. Um, moving to the growth challenge. So um, we've sort of heard and, and seen a bit about growth in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, South East Queensland, based on the most recent regional plan, which came out only a few months ago, um, is on a journey from around about 3.5 million population currently to a population of 5 million in about 25 years. So um, we will see some significant continuing growth in South East Queensland. Um, the challenge that we've got is you know, not dissimilar to Sydney and Melbourne in that a lot of the new greenfield growth is occurring on the city fringe and in the areas that are further outside of the Brisbane, sort of greater Brisbane area. Um, it's also where you find more affordable housing. However, uh, there is an imbalance in the creation of uh, dwellings and in the creation of jobs. So you can see there on the graph, um, they're sort of looking at the blue and the orange. Um, the employment um, in uh, Brisbane will continue to dominate. So people that are moving to um, the outer parts of our network will increasingly need to congregate on Brisbane um, for um, continuing job opportunities into the future. So not only have we got a challenge now, we've got a continuing challenge into the future around how we start to grow the network in a way that supports some of that growth and particularly channeling that growth onto sustainable transport rather than sort of continuing to provide road access for uh, single occupant vehicles coming from very uh, far flung parts of the network. Um, which leads me to the um, transport planning framework that we put together in July. So this um, uh, plan connecting Brisbane was released in early July. Um, it is um, for the first time, and I've been in the transport space in South East Queensland for the last nearly 20 years. So it's the first time we've actually seen um, all parties of government, so Commonwealth government, local government and state government coming together um, to release a shared and joined up uh, policy document around transport. So it was a pretty significant moment when this plan was released. Um, and you can see there it's really about um, moving from the kind of hero infrastructure projects, and I'll talk about a couple of the big initiatives coming out of Connecting Brisbane, moving from an infrastructure-led discussion around how we solve transport problems into a sort of network and service planning approach. So looking at how do we actually provide services that customers need and how do we provide the most efficient way of moving that number of people uh, into the future. So that was released in July. Uh, you can see there it's got a mixture of um, clearly infrastructure but also services and more efficient use of technology, particularly 
in both um, customer-facing technology, looking at ways we can provide real-time information and uh, options for customers about how to move around, but also the more efficient use of data to understand how people are using the network and how we can tailor our growth to continue to meet those needs. Uh, the two big initiatives coming out of Connecting Brisbane, uh, the first of those is um, the Cross River Rail project. So this is a project that um, has been on the books now for, I would say, probably nearly 10 years um, in various forms, um, connecting through Brisbane. Um, it is now um, under the current um, uh, state government, the Labor Party uh, administration is a fully funded project. So it was funded um, as part of the state budget in, uh, in Queensland in June of this year. So uh, capital cost of about $5.4 billion. Um, significant new infrastructure right through the core of the uh, rail network in Brisbane. So about 10 kilometre, 10.2 kilometre alignment all up and about 6 kilometres of that, 5.9 kilometres in tunnel. So you can see there, extending from the south um, in the sort of Dutton Park, uh, Boggo Road area uh, through Woolloongabba, new station at Woolloongabba, a new alignment through the CBD, through, Adelaide, through Albert Street, sorry, uh, with a station in the centre of the CBD and then a major new interchange station underground at Roma Street and connecting around through the exhibition and then surface works connecting up to Albion. So uh, that project will create a new sector from the Gold Coast to the Sunshine Coast on the rail network and will effectively double the capacity. So twin uh, tube tunnel and we've got two tracks over the Merivale Bridge at the moment. So you'll be going from effectively 24 trains an hour to more than 48 once we deliver the signalling solution through the tunnel as well. So um, significant project linked to a lot of broader um, economic benefits in terms of uh, urban regeneration, lots of um, state-owned land, particularly around Woolloongabba and Roma Street. Uh, Woolloongabba, the early works have started, so the, um, the major government printing uh, building and, and uh, works at Woolloongabba have in the process of being demolished for significant new redevelopment around a new train station. And uh, recent news, as only um, recently as I think Saturday or Sunday, um, news of potential partnerships around the Roma Street precinct, looking at some air rights over the sort of rail yards, creation of a live Brisbane Live um, sort of entertainment precinct um, in that area. So quite a lot of um, energy around Cross River Rail. Um, as I said, it's been a project that has been um, uh, building for some period. It is now funded, and um, obviously we all await um, the uh, various political parties' positions on Cross River Rail moving into the state election and then beyond. Uh, there is an expression of interest at the moment with industry for um, uh, looking at some of the early uh, tunnelling and station works, which I think might close in the next week or two. So there's a lot of interest in that, um, in that project at the moment. Uh, the other one is the uh, Brisbane Metro project. So this is the sort of other half of the solution. One is about solving rail capacity constraints. The other one is about trying to manage um, the uh, capacity constraints on the Brisbane busway network. So the Brisbane Metro project is really a, um, it's a look at sort of repurposing part of the Brisbane busway, so 21 kilometres of busway, um, not so much looking at sort of pulling the, the surface up and putting tracks down or anything like that. It is a bus-based solution, although it's called a metro. Uh, the reference vehicle is a 25 metre bi-articulated bus. Um, so, um, that's part of the, the work that will go on around the market engagement leading into procurement in 2018, but currently the reference vehicle is 60 of them, so 60 um, new metro vehicles, bi-articulated bus, capable of about 150 capacity, I think is the current um, the working uh, uh, vehicle that's being worked on. So um, that will really look at sort of opening up, um, uh, putting a lot more people on, on buses um, and picking up a couple of the key routes. So the orange route that you see there um, coming in from the south from Eight Mile Plains, uh, that replaces uh, two of the most popular services, the 111 and the 160, um, servicing uh, the South East Busway and into the city. And then the green uh, link that you see there is basically mirroring the current Route 66, which connects um, two of the uh, Brisbane's major universities, uh, University of Queensland and Queensland University of Technology, and also two of the region's largest hospitals in the Mater Hospital and the Royal Brisbane Hospital. So um, those two routes um, are really looking at converting current bus operations into um, larger vehicles and starting to create more of a, a high capacity spine, uh, looking at things like off-board validation, um, lots more doors in buses to get people on and off buses faster and start to use the capacity available on the busway. 
and also looking at investing in things like a new underground station at Cultural Centre and repurposing the Victoria Bridge uh, into what's called the Green Bridge, so just for metro services, uh, bus services, um, walking and cycling, so taking private vehicles off the Victoria Bridge. So a lot of work happening um, in that project. Um, it has a preliminary business case completed and um, the expectation is it will go to market in 2018 um, to move forward in terms of um, implementation. Capital cost of that's about 940 million. So um, you can see there it's you know, certainly um, a lot more affordable than a rail solution. Um, however, I think the work that's been done in connecting Brisbane highlights that the two of these solutions, it's not sort of one or the other. Uh, they are complementary in terms of rail meeting the longer distance passenger need in terms of those uh, growth areas on the extremities of Brisbane and, and South East Queensland and the bus uh, sort of metro solution picking up on um, how we get more out of the busway network and really starting to continue the growth um, of the bus network in Brisbane. Um, Cross River Rail and the metro interface you can see there. So again, the value of this is about bringing projects together. Um, major sort of hubs at Boggo Road. So we would uh, expect, and the transport model highlights significant uh, rail to rail transfer, significant bus to rail, and also rail to bus. So that you're getting all modes working together as part of integrated stations. Uh, Boggo Road is the big precinct, Bull and Gabba at the stadium there, as well as uh, Roma Street, where we've got um, the metro and busway network converging on the current rail network and the future cross river rail network all in one place. So a lot of work in terms of how you stitch all of those things together. Um, a big part of, and I talked about, um, about the sort of service planning approach, is moving from, you know, we've got a lot of buses that um, do what we call single seat journeys. So they pick up people in their suburban streets, they join the busway and they travel into Brisbane. Um, as a result, we've got, like I said, more than 200 buses an hour in the peak hour using the busway network. Um, we're getting a lot of challenges around um, station capacity and key intersection capacity. Um, a lot of those vehicles um, are not full. Now, some of them are not even half full because they're picking up people from sort of an out-of-flung out of suburban area and they're travelling all the way into the city using up those um, really valuable paths on the busway. Uh, what we want to move to is um, creating a much stronger trunk on the bus network through the use of this larger vehicle, allowing us to then start to feed services in and having interchange from local buses onto metro buses and connecting to the CBD. However, you can see in the, in the name the, uh, the hybrid network. It's not that every service will do that, and I think you know, we've certainly had some experience looking at network planning in Brisbane. The objective here is not to sort of empty a full bus in, a P in an AM or PM peak period and expect people to change onto a metro service. Um, we would look at a hybrid network where we would run full buses into the city as we currently do. However, uh, those buses that are serving smaller sort of suburban catchments, the opportunity to feed those buses onto the metro network. So um, quite a bit happening in that sort of service planning space and um, the value of um, a transit, I guess, in what we bring is integrated ticketing, so there's no penalty for people moving between modes. We also bring um, a one sort of network approach to our uh, information and branding. So customers through journey planning applications have all the information at their fingertips to enable them to move from uh, one mode to the other. It also allows other um, complementary services in the mobility space to feed into that system as well, whether that's the sort of first mile, last mile small buses, whether it's ride sharing and other forms of mobility that might feed onto and feed into this trunk uh, that we're creating on the network. Um, final slide from me is just really around um, what's coming up in terms of the investment plan. Clearly, um, uh, infrastructure is part of it, and we have um, a, a number of major business cases before government at the moment for significant investment, um, and we're obviously hopeful that they will keep moving through that pipeline. Uh, services, um, we think that despite the um, sort of reinvestment and looking at the ability to um, feed uh, local services into the trunk, we need to continue to provide new investment into services, uh, particularly when we compare that investment with other forms of investment in the road network and creating the sort of city that we want to create in Brisbane. Uh, the future service investment is particularly important. Um, technology I've talked about, uh, that's the use of customer-facing technology to make it easier for customers. It's also trying to turn all of the data that we collect every day into insight into how we use that data to design a network that better meets the needs of customers and also provides um, a greater level of efficiency in terms of how we're investing those um, service planning and service funding dollars. And the final one is around priority, uh, particularly 
for um, bus networks that don't operate on this core trunk that will be the uh, metro system, all of our sort of cross-town feeder type services, um, how do we provide uh, greater levels of priority on key arterial roads? Um, some of those roads are managed by our department, some of the arterial roads, some of them are managed by various local governments. It's about looking at creating what we used to call quality bus corridors, looking at um, uh, good information, uh, good roadside infrastructure and also targeted priority along those key corridors to make sure we can provide the level of efficiency and reliability that customers need um, to encourage them to get out of their cars and, um, and move into public transport. So that's it from me for today, but I'm um, happy to um, well obviously take questions now or even um, have follow-up discussions over the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, any questions from the floor? Um, Matt, Brisbane for a long time has really had a strong focus on bus rapid transit and your bus metro. Um, how much of the current thinking when you're thinking about the bus metro going forward has been based around future autonomy and that the reality is if you believe in autonomy then a series of buses that are platooning along effectively is just a train set of seats operating on you know, dedicated infrastructure and, uh, and does does that discussion sort of say, well, is rail or fixed infrastructure fast becoming obsolete if we believe in autonomy? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Good question. And you know, the work we've done on the metro, I think, illustrates that we've got a fantastic piece of infrastructure in the busway. Um, the, the feasibility of ripping that up, putting tracks down to create either light rail or metro rail, it doesn't give you the boost in capacity and it creates lots of obsolescence in terms of the investment we've already put into the network. Uh, we see that by using the busway and effectively, even though it's called a metro, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long bus, um, gives us the flexibility over time to look at whether it's different engine technology or different autonomy in terms of that vehicle, still using the same infrastructure without the need to create um, the disruption through the centre of Brisbane by putting down sort of whether it's light rail or heavy rail. Um, Cross River Rail is really about the heavy, connecting to the heavy rail network. Metro is about taking um, the bus network on the busway to the next level of capacity. 